Carl. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, again, I'm Roger Green and I'm the editor of The New Polis. Uh, um, and this afternoon's session is on a, a book called The Colonial Compromise, um, which is out this year. Um, and it is a book dedicated to the teaching and the work of uh, Dr. Tink Tinker, if you could remember to be, keep yourself muted unless you're presenting. Um, uh, it's a book dedicated to the, the life's work and teaching of, of Dr. Tink Tinker, um, who is um, part of the session this afternoon. Uh, Barbara Mann, might, who's a contributor, might be joining us around two o'clock. So just to let you all know, she, she might be popping in a little bit late. Um, but other than that, I'm going to turn it over to Tink and he's going to kind of talk about what the, um, how the book came about. I need to uh, say, first off, how appreciative I am to uh, Professor Miguel de la Torre for, for bringing this book together and editing it. Uh, we've been colleagues for a good long time, very close colleagues at Isla School of Theology. Uh, when we first conceived of the book Miguel, I had no idea that it would be as much of a problem as it turned out to be <laughs> dealing with the publisher in particular, who had all kinds of rules and regulations and then put such a steep price tag on the book that uh, it'll only sell to institutional libraries. But I'm deeply, deeply appreciative uh, to Miguel for what he's done uh, uh, for me. When I first came up with the title and, and, and Miguel asked me to title the volume. I chose the colonial compromise, the threat of the gospel to the indigenous worldview as maybe a useful way of getting at how Christianity and its missionaries forcing, coercing, converting American Indians to different denominations was so much a part of colonialism. Uh, I, I, I was known at Isla for saying Christianity is colonialism, colonialism is Christianity, referring to European colonialism since 1492. The net result has been that huge numbers of American Indians on Turtle Island have indeed joined Christian churches, different denominations, Catholic, Protestant, and have made Christianity their own without sorting through what sort of compromises we had to make in order to join churches. We had to give up the foundation of our egalitarian, collateral egalitarian worldview in order to buy into this hierarchical up-down image schema that, that, that comes with Euro-Christians and their invasion of Turtle Island. That, that for starters, um, there are huge cultural worldview compromises that Indian people have been forced to make, and not just Indian people, but indigenous people all over the globe. That, that was my interest in, in uh, providing this title and, and inviting uh, these authors, these colleagues and friends uh, to write chapters for the book. My own piece, which I wrote at the very end, uh, after seeing what my other colleagues had written, was probably the most personal and ref, uh, biographically reflective piece that I've ever written uh, in, in the half dozen books, a hundred or so, uh, nearly a hundred uh, journal articles that I've published and chapters in books. I went back and, and thought through my life and how my thinking had changed, how I had changed as I went through a serious process of decolonizing the self 
and participating communally uh, in, in the urban Indian community uh, of decolonizing ourselves as Indian people. Um, and again, I thank Miguel for, uh, for bringing this book together because it, it really did, uh, in a sense, force me to do that kind of thinking and to do that kind of writing. And, and I was really happy with the essay uh, when, when I'd finished it. I thought I'd done something that, that really did uh, put a capstone on my career and uh, haven't stopped writing since then. And I'm still learning, so I, maybe I need to rewrite that essay in about 10 years. <laughs> but, but for now, it captures where I am in my own growth and thinking. I'll stop there. I want to hear from, uh, from Miguel and the others. Kakuna, with the Thank you, Dr. Tinka. Um, first of all, um, though the book is a uh, fresh riff to Dr. Tinka, I'm the one that feels that was totally honored to, to, to be the editor of the book and putting it together. And, and I say this because all too often, anybody who ever edited a book knows that um, you usually have a hard time putting it together because of the contributors. But in this case, all the contributors have really rose above and went beyond the call of duty and, and they work so well with me. And it was really a pleasure bringing the book together. Um, the only concerns I had was with the publisher, as, as Dr. Tinker um, alluded to, which um, is usually not the case, but in this, in this time it was. So, so I am honored to be included in, in, in this particular book. The chapter that I wrote is called um, I'm an Indian Too. And what I was trying to do in that chapter was several things. Um, first of all, um, as obviously I'm not indigenous. So therefore, in all honesty, there's nothing I can say with any integrity about what it means to be indigenous um, in, 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 in this world. The only thing I could say with integrity is how I am privileged by not being indigenous, how I am complicit with structures of oppression. So the, the, the chapter began to try to deal with my own complicity. And I dealt with it by looking at one of my intellectual mentors, um, and that's Jose Mati. And anyone who knows anything about me, Jose Mati really shaped a lot of my thinking. And he's someone that, 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 that's so important to me that um, I'm in the process of writing three volumes, each about 300 pages each, on his work and, and his thinking. So even though I told, truly admire the man, um, I began to be concerned with how he understood the indigenous community. Um, he was a Cuban, late 1800s, but lived in Guatemala and Mexico. And one of the things that uh, Mati does, and, and just to take a step back, Mati is celebrated throughout the Americas as being one of the first to say that the indigenous community must be part of any future of the Americas um, during the time when, when that was not common. And while it seems like this is something to be celebrated, when you dig deeper, it is highly problematic because he attempts to eliminate the Indian um, so that he too can become Indian. Um, he writes a famous phrase, uh, mas que blanco, mas que negro, mas que mulato, um, more than white, more than black, more than um, biracial. And, and what he says is that to be Cuban, we're not black, we're not white, we're you know, not mulatto, we're all just Cubans. Therefore, um, as a white Cuban, I'm also black. And, 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 you know, and, and, and black Cubans are also white. We don't have race. It's, it's, it's probably one of the first times that there's this color blindness um, instituted uh, socially. Um, so I, I looked at some of his writings concerning the indigenous people, and he does the same thing there, in where he literally takes the place of Indians, because if all Cubans are also Indian, then no Cuban is responsible no, you know, for, for the genocide of Indians, of the Taino people. And, and the Taino people are they're also now responsible for their own genocides because they are also Cuban. Uh, he goes so far in, 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 a, in a doodle, in one of his writings, of literally putting his head um, on top of the body of an Indian. 
So, so there's this appropriation of, of, of saying that he too is an Indian. So this for a, um, all Cubans are no longer responsible for the genocide of Indians. And, and, I, and I found that argument very interesting because I believe, or I argue that it continues today where you have people like even Fidel Castro in, in, in certain instances referring to himself as we Indians, you know, first went ahead and, 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 and fought against the colonizers when he was talking about the U.S. as the new colonizers. Uh, che Guevara is portrayed as the new Atue, um, the, the, one of the first indigenous people to fight the Spanish conquistadores. So, so, so the chapter really began to deal with someone who I've always admired, but began to show how his um, understanding of the indigenous people only reinforces um, this colonization of human minds um, even while he is still being celebrated for being one of the most progressive individuals dealing with Indians. So that was the complexity of that chapter. And, and, and it was my original research, which is going to appear in a book that I'm just about finishing now, dealing with uh, Matisse, racism, uh, sexism, and uh, heterosexism. And I'll leave it on at that and, and, and pass it on to one of the other contributors of the, of the manuscript. I, uh, uh, this is Edward Antonio. Um, um, first of all, um, I would like to, to say thank you very much to, uh, uh, to Carl and Roger for, for putting this conference together. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to uh, Professor Ting Tinker, um, you know, uh, uh, who, uh, the person we honored in uh, writing for this book. And I want to say thank you to Professor uh, uh, Miguel de la Torre uh, uh, for, for putting this book together. Um, I was a little surprised when the book came out, um, uh, uh, Dr. de la Torre, uh, because I um, didn't expect that my chapter would be the lead chapter. And uh, that pleasantly took me off guard. Uh, I felt humbled. Uh, I felt Kind of confused by 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 it because uh, I think you will not like to hear this. I felt as if I was the one who was being honored. Um, but um, um, uh, you know, I I, I say that uh, um, to acknowledge uh, the close relationship I've had with Tink, uh, you know, with Dr. Tink Tinker uh, uh, over many years, over thirty years actually, from when we first met uh, uh, in 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 Nairobi uh, uh, in Kenya. Uh, uh, at a conference. Um, so, you know, just to be, uh, 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 to be grateful for, um, you know, for the opportunity to write for, uh, uh, for Tink and uh, uh, for Miguel's invitation to contribute. My, my chapter in the book uh, gave me an opportunity to do something that uh, at least at the beginning of the chapter, something that I've never done before. And that is to attend to my own name uh, in public. Uh, Edward Felipe Jose Antonio. Um, um, colonial through and through. There's not a single African name in that concatenation of names. Eduardo Felipe Jose Antonio. Um, and you know, uh, as I began to write this chapter and pay attention to the question of, you know, what does it mean to be an indigenous person um, uh, and what kind of indigenous person and, and why am I in this company of indigenous people who are in some ways different from the indigenous people of Africa I know. Um, it occurred to me uh, that one of the things uh, I needed to do was to, to come to terms with, uh, with my name. Right, and so um, one of the very first things I do in the book in a section called the location of the indigenous self um, is to admit that I, I, I have never used uh, my last name. I have a last name, uh, an indigenous last name. It's not Antonio, it is Gatawa. Um, so it would be Eduardo Felipe Jose Gatawa. Um, and this is actually the first time I'm also saying it at a conference. So the book did give me an opportunity to do that. And um, then secondly, I, I, I moved on to, to sort of engage with 
uh, this question of colonial compromise. Um, and I struggled, um, right? I, I wanted to write a chapter um, uh, in which I compared indigenous cultures and experiences and rituals, uh, you know, looking at uh, Native Americans uh, uh, in American indigenous cultures and African cultures. And I never quite got there um, because I began to focus more and more on the ways in which colonialism uh, is a demand on the colonized to compromise. Um, it is a demand to compromise if you are to survive in the modern world. Um, it is a demand to give up who you are uh, as, um, uh, as a person to become something else, which is why we end up with all these foreign you know, names. And that you know, brought me to the question of language. Um, and, and I think this is germane to the theme of this conference, right? Think about it for a moment. Uh, we are conducting this conference in a language other than our own. Um, Right, this is one of the ways in which the, the colonial process has kind of absolutized itself, made itself in some ways indispensable, and has left us therefore um, struggling with this question of how we compromise what we want to say when we speak in and through the master's language. Right, so throughout the, the essay, you know, I touch on various ways. Um, you know, in which compromise works. I interrogate the notion of compromise itself. Uh, I interrogate the notion of complicity, um, the threat of the gospel. Uh, you know, I look at that in, in, in a detailed kind of way. Um, and and I, I look at how um, indigenous cultures uh, throughout the world um, have consistently uh, been put down, denigrated, derided, uh, uh, and, and rejected as a way of, of, of subjugating indigenous peoples. I will stop there uh, and we can continue the discussion on this and other chapters later on. I guess I'll go next. Um, first off, this is very easy. Um, book to participate in, do the preparation in a certain sense. And that is that once abstract was presented and accepted, latitude was given, say what you want. And I would like to thank Miguel for that. But I'd like also to thank Tink for giving me something to say in this regard. The topic I chose to emphasize really goes to the nature of our interaction intellectually through the third of a century at least that we've uh, engaged, not as colleagues in the sense that we taught in the same school, but in a broader sense of working on a common project and that project was a practical one, both intellectual and in application. We've laughed together, cried together, gone to jail together, um, been in ceremony together. Tink saw me through major personal crisis. So the relationship comes closer what in this language would be referred to as brothers in a very real sense, not in terms of common lineage, but in terms of the nature of our connection. Now I say that the focus of my essay, my contribution, to the volume really had to do with something that was core to what we were working on and still are working on. And that is the notion of genocide. The word that was coined by Raphael Lemkin, exiled Polish Jewish jurist 
1944 it didn't really exist prior to that the meaning of that the word generates a sort of visceral response both repugnance people recoiling in horror from it and in terms of a, a biting one would say compulsive or obsessive need drive to deny by the perpetrators of genocide in my work i've taken limken at his word that genocide first of all is not a synonym for killing killing can enter in but it's not a simple matter of mass murder which is how it is popularly understood certainly in the united states but i would say by perpetrator populations more generally genocide might be framed this way any policy undertaken with the intent expressed or not to bring about the dissolution and ultimate disappearance of an identified or identifiable human group culture society as such is genocide it can be accomplished as has been pointed out by Limkin himself even if hypothetically no individual human being were to be killed in the process that is true in a, a biological sense no less than in a cultural sense biologically all that would be required and this is a mouthful all that would be required would be to bring about cessation of reproduction within a group this can be undertaken by compulsory sterilization by compulsory abortion by segregation of the sexes and we find all three of those practices no without killing a single human being you would take the targeted group out of existence in a single generation that is approximately a half century killing no one physically disappeared there's many nuances that are attached to that but he pointed out that genocide in the sense that we're discussing it here has been perpetrated the crime is ancient although the term is new is how he put it primarily through cultural means the destruction of language spiritual belief systems continuity in terms of social organization and so on dispersal ways which do not figure necessarily in terms of the biological eradication of the targeted group you can still bring about their dissolution and disappearance as a human group even though all of the individuals hypothetically again theoretically might survive and reproduce biologically in the future as parts of other societies this is the focus the thing has had particularly important effect on as for myself i focus essentially on the physical always mentioning the fact that killing whether by direct means of extermination or what Lincoln referred to as slow death measures the imposition of them um, eradication of subsistence economy deprivation of ability to obtain medical care whether that's from the perpetrator society or traditionally 
and so on. Well, absent food, absent uh, ability to treat disease, you have mass death. It can be imposed as a matter of policy by denial of healthcare, denial of uh, proper nutrition and so forth. I focus there, but always mentioning that killing, whether one variety or the other, or some combination of the two represents one fifth of the definition, legally speaking, of genocide that is promulgated by the United Nations in 1948, and Lincoln drafted that. But it was a great diminishment in the scope of what he was talking about. They, to all intents and purposes, eliminated the cultural dimension and tried to make it something else, something referred to in the literature since roughly 1950 as ethnocide. But if you look at the first page of the chapter on genocide, where the term is coined in his 1940, Lincoln's 1944 book, uh, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe is the title, you'll find in a footnote at the bottom of the very first page that what he's terming genocide, he could as easily have called ethnocide, but stylistically, as it appears, he preferred genocide. He explains the derivation of both uh, neologisms at that place. Ethnocide is not something different from genocide. It's simply a form of genocide. That's where pink weight has come in. I took as my particular during this 30 odd year period of our interactive effort to bring indigenous people, particularly Indians of North America into the discourse involving genocide, into that debate, into the consciousness. Tank on the other hand, from the get go used genocide to refer almost solely to the cultural dimensions, particularly the eradication of spiritual belief systems. And there is a lot to be covered there. But where I was recognized as focusing on the best known element of genocide, the most distortive element of what's believed to be comprehensive of genocide on the one hand, mentioning the other elements of genocide that were included in legal definition and sometimes expounding on the broader definition that Lemkin had originally advanced, Tink reversed the process. So I end up being, at least until the last five or 10 years, the most cited scholar with regard to the genocide of American Indians. Tank, on the other hand, brought the rest of the definition to bear and ends up being, to all intents and purposes, so far as I know, in the same time frame, pretty much up to current, the only scholar repetitively referenced with regard to cultural genocide. And in that, I think that particular combination of elements, both introducing indigenous people full-fledged into the discourse consideration as to having undergone genocide in having undergone it in ongoing fashion. We arrive at a, a, a point where we understand that there can be no compromise. Sartre in 1967 famously observed that colonialism is genocide. The point to make there is that you cannot compromise with genocide. Genocide in the framework or context of compromise simply consummates itself. So 
we are in a position where the colonial compromise is itself something to be rejected. Decolonization, for lack of a better term, is the only method of ending genocide and decolonization requires a reconstitution, a resurgence, a reconstruction, if you will, of what's by Tink's definition, indigenous worldview, that is not only to understand the world in ways contrary to the colonial tradition, but to apply that knowledge practically to organize societies, economies, and so forth in a way free from not simply what particular set of relations, but the whole context that gave rise to colonialism it has to do with the attempted, perhaps in some cases successful, epistemicide that has attended the colonizing process, reversing course to open up the future for a re-actualization of the indigenous world. I've already talked too long, so at that point, I'll simply stop and see where we end up in Q&A. If it's good, I think I'll I'll keep going from there. Does that work? Um, I'm Natsu Saito. For those of y'all who don't know, that was Ward Churchill, even mm. though Natsu Saito's name appears on the screen. Um, yeah. <laughs> we are um, really glad to be able to join this. It, it's really such an honor to participate in this conference but also in the book. Um, thank you very much, Tink and Miguel and everyone who worked so hard on it. Um, we are in the process of driving across the country and at the moment we're in Mississippi on Chickasaw land, but just yesterday we were driving across Oklahoma. And so of course we had to think about you Tink and um, all of your, your people in Oklahoma as well. In thinking about what I wanted to address for this book, I was thinking about Tink scholarship and the impact it had on me and um, the amazing contributions he's he's made. And they're really, really difficult to summarize. Um, but what I wanted to address was the fact that Tink's critique and his explanations of you know what what's happening in the world, what's hap been happening to indigenous peoples throughout in, in certainly in North America throughout the colonization um, since 1492 has really, we think of it often as focusing on religion and on the, the destruction that has been wrought by the Euro-Christian worldview. And often I think we tend, it's easy anyway, to limit that to Christian. Tink always says Euro-Christian, but often we think of it as, yes, the missionaries came and did this harm by imposing a Christian framework on various understandings of the world. And what I wanted to address was the fact that his all of his critique and all of his um, insights apply equally well to those of us who may have long ago rejected Christianity and may therefore think, oh, well, yes, I can join in this critique of Christianity because I don't believe all that. And um, yes, you know, Christianity has done horrible thing through the centuries to indigenous peoples all over the world and to be sort of self-righteous about it. And I wanted to emphasize that all of what he's saying also applies to what is often viewed as a secular Western worldview. So that his critique applies not just to religion, but to what we often think of as science or scientific truth. And of course, right there, we have this dichotomy that Western society puts you know, between uh, dividing religion and science, or as I put in my title of my chapter, faith and facts. And 
in the course of doing that, what I did was look at various pieces that Tink has written that I think are have been particularly influential to me anyway, and to try to look at sort of some of the themes. And I think I hope that I didn't impose too much of my own perspective on this. I hope <laughs> I hope this is reflective of, of what you actually said, but please feel free to challenge it. Um, but what I saw was coming out of it was that there are colonial presumptions underlying both religion and science as understood in sort of this Western worldview that, that is dominant in our society now. Um, and some of those presumptions have to do, they some of them we've already mentioned today, but they have to do with organizing the world hierarchically, with the notion of dominion, of humans exercising control over nature, of individuation and atomization, um, of temporality versus spatiality and of this whole notion of progress that things are going in this unilinear direction and getting better and better um, and that those presumptions come with both the religious and a secular um, worldview in colonial society and working with those um, I then saw that he articulates the choices that we're being forced to make within this framework and that how they're choices that then reinforce the framework or the, the paradigm, regardless of which side of it you take. So, you know, we think that we're looking at both sides of the issue here or all, you know, more than one side, more than one perspective by having say discussions about, you know, is this scientific truth or is this, um, sort of faith-based um, perspectives. But in fact, by choosing one or the other, we are in fact reinforcing the paradigm that divides them and that has those presumptions built into them. And what Tink's work does really is help us think outside of this paradigm by identifying sort of structural distinctions between worldviews. And those I addressed in terms of distinctions between space and time between the notion of progress or salvation and balance or harmony. Um, a third one is the distinction between individuation or atomization and interrelatedness. And then a fourth is um, his emphasis on how we're not just related to all living things and living is understood in, in the most encompassing possible way, um, but that it's specific. It's not just some kind of generic, oh, we're all related, but it's, it's a very specific tie to specific relatives in the place where we are and therefore to specific lands. Um, and then finally, um, I think he identifies in his work ways that we can get beyond this, right, move into a worldview that is not colonized and to a more liberatory perspective. And a couple of points along those lines that I thought were particularly significant um, has to do with, first of all, in addressing the problems that we see and that we know that indigenous communities encounter all the time, that we have to go beyond characterizing them, them in terms of racism or po and poverty and therefore framing our solutions or limiting our solutions to those which involve sort of anti-racist perspectives and trying to address economic inequalities. We have to move, we have to see the problem as colonization and how colonization is something more than discrimination or dispossession. Um, and therefore, of course, we have to start thinking in terms of what it would mean to decolonize um, and a part of that is his um, very clear assessment or articulation of how we have to think beyond states and how we have to have a different understanding of sovereignty that isn't state-based and therefore isn't reliant on state formations to provide the solutions. And finally, he talks about decolonizing our thinking and our language. And that, of course, has been sort of the theme throughout all of these presentations. Um, and something that I, that I thought was particularly helpful in terms of that process of decolonizing our thinking and 
the way we frame issues is his emphasis on recognizing reciprocal dualities. And I'm really hoping Barbara Mann will be able to join us because she um, certainly is, has written a great deal about reciprocal dualities just as Tink has. But those are the, some of the um, things that I, that I found most um, inspiring about his work and really helpful in terms of framing and understanding of our current colonial realities that certainly does address Christianity, but also isn't limited to what we often think of as a Christian worldview. Thanks. Okay, um, I'm the only one left and, until Barbara um, hopefully shows up. Um, so I'm particularly honored um, uh, to be part of this collection, um, partly because I, I, I feel like it's my job as the younger scholar to take some of this on and keep passing it to my own students. Um, and this is an ongoing relationship uh, b between myself and, and Tink, um, with whom I meet every week <laughs> um, for, for years now. Um, uh, and, and some of our other friends, Jill Fleshman, who's in the, the audience here. Um, the, I, I also want to acknowledge um, uh, our friend um, and deceased colleague, Luis Leon, who I think was part of this whole project and who I was trying to um, deal with these two mentors of mine uh, as I wrote the chapter for this book. And Luis has this concept of religious poetics and uh, um, and then I have, and then I had Tink, and I was sort of having, as a student, to deal with both of these these perspectives, and and sometimes they were really clashing with each other, um, as as I was trying to reconcile this. So um, I'll I'll be pretty brief. Uh, I want to ground um, some language here, especially for people who are in the audience who might. Uh, um, not have a lot of this history. So I think one of the grounding points for Tink's. Um, uh, thinking is that we we really do have to kind of look back to 1492, um, at least uh, in this part of the world, to what really shifted and what, what happened there. And um, I'm particularly attentive to this language of the papal bulls and to the requerimiento, um, which I'm going to read from here. And, and, and just try and imagine the context of um, uh, the Europeans knew very well um, uh, that this kind of thinking would not be welcomed so much to, that um, Robert J. Miller records instances of, of of them sort of passing by and yelling it off their boats, right? That, that this was the the requirement that they were supposed to read, and this was this was supposed to be a human rights move, by the way. Um, and the last paragraph says. So, you know, just imagine somebody sort of, sort of like passing by in a boat yelling this off to you. Um, but if you do not do this and maliciously make delay in it, if you don't become a Christian, if you don't acknowledge a Christian prince, um, I certify to you that with the help of God, we shall powerfully enter your into your country and shall make war against you in all the ways and manners that we can and shall subject you to the yoke and the obedience of the church and of their highnesses. We shall take you and your wives and your children and shall make slaves of them, and as such shall sell and dispose of them as their highnesses may command. And we shall take away your goods and shall do you all the mischief and damage that we can as to the vassals who do not obey and refuse to receive their Lord and resist and contradict him. And we protest that the deaths and losses which shall accrue from this are your fault and not that of their highnesses or ours, nor of these cavaliers who come with us. So this is an example of, of my, my, in my chapter, what I call conscripted um, compromise. And I take that term from a book that actually Tink introduced me to by David Scott, who's a Caribbean scholar. Um, who wrote a great book called um, Conscripts of Modernity, and this way that through writing, through this kind of rhetoric, people are included when they're, they don't even know that they're being included. I mean, most people couldn't have understood the Spanish that was being, you know, 
um, yelled off of off of the boats here. Um, so that's one really just concrete example of of this kind of colonial thinking that persists um, in our legal language through the doctrine of discovery through 1823's Johnson v. McIntosh, which came up in Sheldon um, Spotted Elk's talk this morning. Um, and something that came up with Sheldon this morning, who's Northern Cheyenne, um, he was talking about the braids, the four bra braids um, that Cheyenne children wear in their hair, one for each direction, and then a fifth one, which is kind of a, a connecting one that comes out of the center center of their, their heads. Um, and he was talking about uh, boarding schools and uh, uh, um, being a descendant of the Sand Creek Massacre um, himself. Uh, in my chapter, I was trying to think very much in terms of, of, of the Southern continent because I was doing work um, related to, to that. And if you just look at, like I pulled up the Wikipedia entry on the so-called Inca Empire, and they say <laughs> Inca Empire um, in Quechua, um, to want and sue you. And it literally means in four parts together. So how do we get this concept of empire? <laughs> what comes with that concept of empire when in the in, in the literal language, it means four parts together? So uh, I've been trying very much to think about um, things that Barbara Mann has said in her book, Spirits of Blood, Spirits of Breath, about the twinned cosmos of um, indigenous America um, and um, uh, integrate her thinking on that and fractal genocide and Ward Churchill's scholarship of genocide um, into what um, Stephen Newcomb and Tink Tinker have called deep framing or deep cognitive framing. So it's, uh, Steve Newcomb's not here today, but he's, he has a chapter in the book and a great book called Pagans in the Promised Land where he talks uh, about um, deep framing and um, cognitive linguistics drawing on people like George Lakoff. Um, but what I think that both Tink Tinker and uh, Stephen Newcomb do really well is they, they, they're able to talk about the ways that, yes, the ways that we think in a cognitive sense, it's not just metaphor. We think metaphorically, but it really does create real physical neural pathways in our brains. Um, it's, it's not just a matter of representation. It's a matter of <laughs> the connectivity uh, in our brains that, that really shape the ways that we think about reality. Um, what I think Tink Tinker and Steve Newcomb are able to do in their analysis of deep framing is uh, to connect it to something intergenerational, which I don't think is something that, that um, uh, scholars like um, George Lakoff are as interested in. Uh, as well. And so how do we think about the ways that persist just like um, what Natsu was just saying in terms of those of us who might think of ourselves as secular or non-Christian, how we're still carrying a Euro-Christian worldview with us. It's not something that I get to choose my way out of my Euro-Christianness. Um, uh, and, and those are the things, things I was wrestling with. Um, I see some questions in the chat and, uh, I'm going to send Barbara Mann just a, a quick link to the, to the talk to make sure, I know she had something till two, just to make sure she's available. So thank you very much. I'm very honored to be part of this. Tink, did you have any responses, maybe? Yeah, I, I have lots of responses, but I'm going to try and be a little briefer than that. I, I want to pick up on what Natsu was saying, because far from wanting to correct any of what she says, I want to advance what she was saying. Um, when I talk about Euro-Christians, I'm using that as a sociological signifier and not a religious signifier. So Euro-Christian is different from Christian, yet the two are thoroughly intertwined with one another. And I suppose the clearest way to see it is to read uh, uh, John Marshall's 1823, uh, 
unanimous decision in Johnson v. McIntosh, where it's perfectly clear where he gives the name to the doctrine of discovery, the, this papal bull uh, of, of 1493, uh, and clearly says that it is the Christianity, the religion of the European conquerors who made their conquest moral, just, and legal. Um, and it's not just the, the invention of religious language that gets imposed on native people, but, but the invention of legal language, which is equally imposed. In fact, it's the legal invention that does more to secure the conquest of the continent in the theft of the land, the conversion of the land from land to property, the baptism of the land as Christian property. Uh, and, and to this day, we get snookered into believing that somehow all of this is useful language so that we have a, a, a thousand and one Indian lawyers from Indian nations in Oklahoma alone who think that federal Indian law somehow is Indian. And of course, it's not Indian at all. It's colonizer language invented by the colonizer with one intention only, and that intention is to control the native peoples in order to make access to native lands uh, more readily uh, available uh, to, to your Christian peoples. So that uh, uh, there's more to this than just the religion. But for me, talking about the colonial compromise in terms of the gospel and, and uh, the, the coerced conversion of Indian peoples is a way of getting at that greater whole, uh, get, getting at the way history is taught, getting at the American imaginary, which, which romanticizes the conquest as somehow a, 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 a good and moral process uh, one that didn't involve violence unless Indian people resisted. What? You think I should not take your home? Well, then I have the right to kill you. Essentially, that's what uh, the, the Spanish requerimiento uh, said to uh, Indian people um, in, in the Caribbean and then in, in uh, Mexico and Central America. Uh, and it's what? John Marshall is saying in Johnson v. McIntosh still uh, 300 years later uh, that we have the right. And in fact, Marshall goes so far as to say it was a fair trade because in return for taking their land, we gave the Indians Christianity and civilization. Uh, that, that says it all uh, in, in terms of colonization and the colonial compromise, uh, and, and in fact, uh, converting to Christianity meant essentially that uh, American Indian people and other indigenous people around the world had a better chance of escaping sure death. So it was death or convert. Uh, much like the, the conversion of, of Irish uh, Catholics during the British conquest to Protestantism uh, in return for a bowl of soup. Um, you know, that's what we were up against. So it comes across in, in all academic disciplines. I mentioned history, but surely the invention of Two disciplines says it all, uh, invented in the late 19th century, comparative religions and anthropology. 
that's where the university exercised its muscle, it, its colonizer might in terms of being the official descriptor of all things indigenous, savage, uh, and uncivilized. Uh, and they were quick to do that before Indian people or other indigenous people became too civilized because they might become too much like us and we could no longer uh, catalog the wild uh, and, and uncivilized nature of their social holes that we rightfully conquered, colonized, and converted. I'll stop there and get other voices involved. Kakuna. I'm remiss, by the way, in not starting this conversation by acknowledging that here in Denver, where I live and from whence I'm speaking, that we're on Cheyenne and Arapaho traditional lands. And I, I always remember uh, those ancestors who are still uh, here in this place and, and the other um, some 45 Indian nations who, uh, who wandered across and used this land as well. Uh, my own people made annual visits to the Rocky Mountains and uh, visited Cheyenne and Arapaho people on their journeys. Kakuna. And there is a question in the chat, um, which I can read in, unless somebody wants to respond to what Tink was saying first. Okay. Uh, um, Alejandro, uh, I want to invite you to say it in your own words, if you like, if you're still with us. Um, otherwise, I will read your question out loud. It's just we need to have them read out loud for the playback because um, people won't have access to the chat on playback. Whose question is it, Roger? It's not clear in the chat. Oh, Alejandro Ar Argumedo. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it out. The question is, Indigenous people's spirituality goes beyond humans, where the principles of reciprocity, balance, and relationality keep us as part of the whole Mother Earth and not outside it. How do you extend your concept of decoloniality to all of our relations? I'll take a stab at it undoubtedly will be an incomplete answer and maybe some others will like to uh, add to it. But I don't know all indigenous traditions, obviously. I'm familiar to a greater or lesser extent with quite a number. And one of the factors they have in common is treating the winged, the four-legged, those that crawl, those that swim, and the earth itself, the sky, the totality of what we inhabit as relatives. We are related to them, they to us, but they are also to each other. And it is in that cognition that you see manifestations of culture that are intended to allow all those relations to continue and flourish, to maintain, as it was said earlier, a balance and a harmony. It's, there are ways that you can see this, define this, is a property relation, if you want to do that, it would be radically different than the John Locke version of property. It's a responsibility rather than a right, but that responsibility goes to respecting the other relatives, their needs, their natures, their contributions to our existence 
the whole. T4 and Lions, I heard put it once that we do not, and by we, he meant not only the Haudenosaunee Confederacy of which he is a faith keeper, but indigenous people more generally. We do not have concept of rights, really. We have a concept of responsibility. And those who are uh, new age types who wanted to practice crystal healing ceremonies and sweat lodges and all the rest of that, uh, completely out of context, as he said, that responsibility is the one thing you're attempting to avoid by asserting your right to practice your version of our religion. And he used the word religion because what was at issue was not spirituality, was not the worldview, the understanding, the knowledge and practice of it. It was sort of a cultural tourism of a sort and a presumption which attended the colonial mentality. I have the right to that which is yours because I want it. Decolonization would require the ability of what uh, Oren, and I would think Tink would agree with this, I know I do, the exception to the rule, if you will, we have no concept of rights other than one, actually, which is the right to fulfill our responsibilities. And under the colonial order, under the white supremacist order, under the materialist Lockean property order of things, there is no way of fulfilling that responsibility. So decolonization would necessarily put an end to the eradication of the habitat of our other relatives, the earth itself, the contamination of the air by virtue of making the priority, not profit, not progress, but sustainability, continuity, balance, and all the rest of it. You look at it that way. In decolonization, decolonizing peoples, our nations, you decolonize all the relatives with whom we were able to maintain balance over millennia upon millennia. It's taken how long to totally destroy the sustainability of that which we occupied generation after generation after generation without destabilizing. Uh, I, I'll leave it right there. I, to me, it's sort of self evident. If sure. decolonization occurred, traditional values and ways of knowing and living were to be restored, not perfectly, but in principle, then all of the others would benefit accordingly. And all of the others would include the colonizers ultimately. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I, I would just add one thing. Uh, I actually mentioned this, but didn't explicate it when I talked about the conversion of the land to property. There are two distinctly different attitudes towards the land, experiences of the land. The colonizers made it property, made it theirs. Whereas in, in Osage, there is no word for property. Just as there is no word for it, no word for thing, all are alive, our people, our relatives. And the land is the mother, the grandmother of all life. So that uh, to, today across Turtle Island, 
from from the United States through Canada, the most prominent public movement of indigenous people is something called land back. That's what natives are calling for, land back. And our white relatives need to be absolutely clear. Indians are not asking for property to be returned to Indian ownership. That would be a mistaken Euro-Christian colonialist idea. What Indian people are asking for is that our relationship to the mother be restored. Our relationship to the land be restored. And along with it, our cultures, our languages, and particularly the American Indian worldview. So, yes, when, when we're talking about uh, the colonial compromise, we're talking about having lost all of that. And at this late date, 500 plus years in, into colonialism, uh, it's no simple task to reclaim what we have lost, what we gave up in that compromise. Kakuna. I wanted to mention two points, just little side points, but things that have really struck me um, in this context. And one is that, as you just said, Tink, it wasn't property and indigenous peoples aren't asking for property back. And I just think that such a difficult notion for those of us who are raised in this Euro-Christian environment to understand is that we're not talking about a more equitable division of property. And this is really what distinguishes this indigenous worldview from a lot of what are considered progressive worldviews or socialist worldviews or whatever, which focus on you know, making the division of property or access to property more equitable. And that's just not what we're talking about. And I love that emphasis you put on Johnson versus McIntosh because you can see it so clearly, right? The land wasn't property when indigenous peoples were here, but you know, without the colonizers. It only becomes property when white people claim it. And so just, you know, trying to wrap our heads around that notion of, you know, getting away from the propertization of everything is really significant. And then the other piece I've just been thinking about is you could, you, I hope you would be willing to, to expand on this a little bit, Tink, but how you talk about, you know, in the Euro-Christian worldview, people, the, the newest relatives to be here are put at the top of the hierarchy, closest to God. Um, and how, in fact, in a, in a more, you know, uh, well, in, in an ind indigenous worldview that, that's rooted in reality, from my perspective, um, you know, it's, it's our ancestors who are the rocks, who are the oldest, who are the wisest, and we're the newest, the most stupid ones, right? And we need to be learning from them rather than imposing on them. And, and that, you know, distinction has just always stood stuck with me so strongly. Oh. If I could. Are we still on? Yep. Uh, okay. If you could, point of clarification. When I said, I made mention of property. I said it was radically different construction or conception of it. By that, I meant to convey the signification of the relation to particular components of geography of Mother Earth. I don't know of a single indigenous people that does not have a relationship with a particular area. Other indigenous peoples may have relations to portions of it. If you try to draw a map of indigenous North America or any place else, so far as I know, other than perhaps an island inhabited by 
one particular group. If you tried to draw that map, it would totally defeat your ability to comprehend visually whose was what, because it's based in the relation, not in a notion of ownership. And yet, and this I think is what Oren was trying to get to, and I've seen you do it, Tink. <clears throat> we all understood that in that relationship, that if something comes to destroy the balance, to harm the ability of us to pass along what we inhabit intact so that it's essentially same ecologically seven generations into the future we will defend that we have a right to defend it okay because we have the responsibility to maintain balance within it. that's all it's very different cannot alienate it that would be essentially to shirk the responsibility to maintain the balance and the harmony within it be part of it we can call it anything if that conveys the idea that indigenous territoriality habitat environment choose your term is not up for grabs because someone does not hold a deed to it then it's okay by me. But the restoration that Tink was describing is possible only within the acknowledgement by the Lockean culture, the Euro Christian culture, to acknowledge that it's not inherently entitled to make a superior disposition of it. And that's been the assumption the rationalization all along. So I don't know if that clarified things a bit or confused them, but I'm not in disagreement at all with the idea that property, as it's been defined in uh, Euro Christian law, is a concept diametrically opposed to that of every indigenous people I know. So just to be clear, if you feel like asking questions or contributing, feel free to write in the chat or let us know. Well, I was holding off to hear from other people. But given the venue of a Zoom conference, I'm less comfortable with silence than I would be if we were all together, because then the silence could be very productive, <laughs> very useful. In the classroom, it's very powerful. You don't have to fill in the spaces with words. In a Zoom conference, it's a, a, a little more awkward to think that way. So, so I, I, I will say a little bit more about this business of property and interrelationship. When I travel, I carry an eagle wing with me. I use it here too. When the family gets together to load a pipe or when we're going to smudge ourselves, smoke ourselves off with me, you know, medicinal smoke from one of our medicines or another, 
but I take it with me when I travel. It's not my eagle wing. It is my relative who travels with me. And here at home, we're very careful to make sure that we set out food. Every time we have a family meal in order to feed the wanagi of that eagle, of my drums, of my pipe, of my staff, and the wanagi of all the ancestors that we call on to come and help our family maintain harmony and balance. Really important to do that. Well, when I traveled to Australia, for some reason, and this, this eagle relative has been with me on uh, multiple trips to Europe, to Asia, to uh, Mexico, to Central America, South America. But as we were coming into Melbourne for a post-colonial conference at the University of Melbourne, where I was a keynote speaker, I got freaked out by the customs form that threatened me with dire consequences if I didn't claim all animal parts. Animal parts? Surely they can't mean my eagle relative. But I know colonialism too well to know that that wouldn't happen. So I scribbled a long note on this uh, back of this customs form explaining that I had this, uh, th this, this relative that was traveling with me. All the furor that erupted because uh, it got escalated from one customs official to the next, to the next, to the next. Finally, I uh, was with the custom official of all custom officials. Uh, and I wouldn't let them touch my relative because they wouldn't know how to handle her. They would treat her as a thing, as it as property and not as a relative with whom they're in close relationship with. Uh, and this final customs official looked up and said, Mate, are you native? Uh, yes, sir. I, I'm American Indian. Get out of here, he said. And I was none too quick to uh, pick up all my stuff and, and, and to grab my relative and, and to head out the door. Um, and, and she kept me strong through that whole conference. But then I realized back in November of last year, they thought it was property and they could have because my option was to get back on the plane and fly home. $2,000 in a round trip ticket that, uh, that, that, that who knows the, the conference may have billed me for it, <laughs> but I wasn't going to leave my relative at, at that counter. That was for sure. But then in November, I realized maybe that wasn't an option because, uh, This woman, Australian woman, traveling in Italy, bought a $19,000 alligator purse. And because she failed to file the proper paperwork for importing that alligator purse, they confiscated it when she went back to Australia at the same customs counter that I was stopped at, and they destroyed the purse. So they could have, that's the power of the colonizer, they could have destroyed my relative without much further ado. That to me is 
very, very scary because I have a responsibility, as Ward was saying, towards this relative. She travels with me to that extent. You know, from this colonial word, world, I am her protector, just as she is my protector when, when I take her out of her case and, and, and use her publicly. That, that, that's what our relationship is with all living things, we're, we're, with the trees and the mountains, the rivers, the stones, the animals and the birds, all living things. Those are all alive. So my daughters had to teach. I've got a 12-year-old. She's had to teach her teachers ever since kindergarten that rocks are not inert. It's the most natural thing in the world for a teacher to teach the class the difference between living, ob living things and, and inert objects. And rock is an inert object. In Osage, we don't have a word for inert. We don't have a word for object, thing. Be because stones are close relatives. That's enough. I want to hear from the rest of you, uh, even those in the in, in the larger conference audience at this point, but but also from uh, uh, authors who haven't spoken as much from uh, Roger Miguel, Edward Antonio, Kakuna. Um, there are... but, so can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Right, so um, Zoom kind of kicked me out, and uh, I'm on the phone right now. Um, uh, Tim, I just wanted to to echo uh, everything that you and Ward said about reciprocity and um, uh, you know relationships to uh, um, you know to, um, to everything around us. Um, I, I, I come from a different kind of indigenous space. Um, you know, in in um, uh, in Zimbabwe, I you know I am a Shona, and um, um, I um, identify as zebra uh, on my father's side, and uh, on my mother's side, you know, I identify as buffalo. That that's how our system uh, uh, works, and we take those relationships, you know, uh, with the four-legged. Uh, you know, uh, the wind and, um, uh, you know, um, creatures that crawl and so on uh, very, very seriously. You know, they're part of us. Everything that you said about stones, uh, um, you know, we believe to be true. Everything, you, you know, um, that you said about our relationships um, to the totality of, of, you know, the world, the so-called uh, you know, cosmos or universe in European languages, um, right? It, you know, we, we are uh, 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 a part of. So one of the remarkable things, Tim, and you and I have talked about this over the years, right, is, is the, the, uh, the deep structures, you know, in terms of similarity, in terms of thinking, uh, among, uh, you know, indigenous peoples who are in far flung you know, places like, the Americas and, you know, Africa. Uh, and so, you know, I, I want to say that because I think it does say something about, uh, you know, what it means to be, uh, to be an indigenous person. I believe that when, you know, col colonialism and colonization kick in, uh, they colonize not just people, um, you know, not just, uh, you know, they, they take over not just land, uh, they take over the, uh, you know, everything, uh, including all these other, you know, relatives that uh, uh, we are talking about here. And for me, decolonization will be incomplete uh, to the extent that it fails to include 
you know, decolonizing, um, you know, uh, those relationships. Because um, we now live in a space, we live in a world in which um, those relationships are commodified, they are colonized, uh, they've become objects for buying and selling. Um, right, you know, we, we cage animals, we put them in zoos, and, and um, you know, we we slaughter them uh, without paying attention to what would happen. You know, for example, in my culture, uh, you know, the rituals that that need to attend to, uh, you know, the killing and the eating uh, uh, of of our relatives. So, um, you know, all of this is to say. Uh, that there are remarkable similarities here, um, which ought not to be discounted uh, as we think about both the history of colonialism, but also the need to decolonize. There are a few comments in the chat. I'll just I'll read a couple of these out. Um, and uh, there was a. Um, uh, Julian Cooney says, we belong to the earth. The earth does not belong to us. Please elaborate. Um, I think that was after Ward was speaking. And then Nelson Kampf says, uh, can, could you speak a bit about what land back might look like in practice today? Um, Alejandro Argumedo says, uh, an important part of the Judeo-Christian creation story is a power of naming that is a power over creation. The Bible tells the story of God giving Adam the power to name the animals and other parts of creation. History and law, as well as literature and politics, are activities of naming. Names have great power, and the power of naming has been used to misappropriate plants, crops, habitats, landscapes by naming it using colonial languages. How um, how role or maybe what role does indigenous languages play in indigenous decolonial processes? There's a couple more, but I'll stop there just to let folks have a chance to. Well, I will uh, say something about this and then, then hope that a couple others will jump in too. The first thing Columbus does, and this is part of baptizing the land and turning it into property, converting it, as he sails through the Caribbean, is to give every geographical point or feature, a new, a new name. He names everything, names it after his majesties in Spain, names it after uh, uh, particular saints or uh, his Lord and Savior. So an island might be named El Salvador, the Savior. Uh, his headquarters was on Española, and the capital city was named after his queen, Isabella. Uh, but he named everything. And in fact, colonizers, as some of you know, continue to do that. Here in Colorado, the tallest peaks visible to us from Denver are Pikes Peak, Mount Evans, and Long's Peak. They all have Cheyenne and Arapaho names. They have Ute names. And yet it's the colonizer names, the names of genocidaire, committers of genocide. You know, John Evans was the first territorial governor of Colorado. 
and he spent the whole summer of 1864 as governor, riling up the population of Denver in particular and Colorado in general to kill Indians. And it was that November 29th that his close Methodist colleague, uh, and, and, and together they were two of five of the trustees the year before assigned to be the, uh, the, the, the founding committee for what is still today the lead Methodist church in Colorado, Trinity Methodist Church in downtown Denver. That same fall, it was his colleague, the pastor, John Shivington, who resigned his church to assume the rank of colonel in the U.S. Army, who led his army units to attack a peaceful Cheyenne and Arapaho village at Sand Creek, who thought they had a treaty with the United States, who thought they were camped where the United States Army told them to camp. In fact, they were. That's how Shivington was able to find them, attacked them at dawn, and murdered several hundred old people, women, and children, because most of the fighting men, fighting age men, had been given permission to leave the camp to go out and hunt buffalo in order to feed the people. That, that's John Evans' participation, immediate participation in the genocide of Indian people. And he actually brags about it 20 years later in an interview with uh, a famous University of California historian uh, in, 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 in Berkeley, uh, from Berkeley, saying it served a purpose because it made Colorado safe for Christian people, for Christian habitation. And it enabled you by killing, it enabled you to steal people's homes. Yeah, that process of renaming is beginning now because uh, you know there's a, we've pressed the the civil government here hard enough and long enough that they are now finally beginning to talk about recovering the native names for some of these places. In the meantime, we still have to drive on Evans Avenue or Downing Street, another genocide there. Uh, eventually, we will rename all of those streets too, maybe not to give them Indian names, but at least to remove the names of genocide there, uh, of, of committers of genocide. So I'm going to stop here. Looks like Miguel's ready to jump in. I, I was planning to jump in my dear colleague, uh, Tinker, and, and bring up a point that I know both you and I disagree on, just to uh, maybe spice things up a little bit. Um, one of the questions asked deals with water, um, uh, which is a good question. And I, and, I'm, and I was thinking how I would answer that, based being that I wrote a book on water that came out last week. Um, but before I do, for me to answer that question, I will have to embrace something that I know you disagree with. And that's the concept of Napante, that in-between space that many Latinx find themselves in. So as a Caribbean boy, obviously, um, I, I'm a light-skinned Latino, but you know, some of my ancestors from my mother's side um, are African uh, from the Yoruba people. So if I was to answer the question on water, I would go to the spirituality of my abuelas and talk about Ochun or Yemaya. Uh, Ochun being, of course, the goddess of the, uh, of the rivers and Yemaya of the ocean, two 
um, indigenous uh, Yoruban um, um, deities that I that I still worship today. If you walk into my office, I have a statue of La Vinja de Cobre, which of course is a Catholic saint, but it's really Ochun, which I light a yellow candle to. So as you know, I find myself living in this Napante, in this in-between space spiritually, in where I don't really belong in either tradition, but at the same time, both tradition has defined my very identity. But I know that you have a problem with, with that. So I, I thought, how would I then deal with this? Not a question that uh, De La Torre and I have not talked about before. <laughs> Yeah, in terms of the colonial compromise, I've argued with my Chicano friends particularly where Napantla is a, a, a doctrinal issue, as it were, that you can't stand in that in-between space forever. You have to make a decision and live one worldview or the other. You can't stand torn between two separate worldviews. And I've argued that if you take Napantla seriously, then you're actually living the colonizer worldview and clinging to some romantic attachment to your native past. And a lot of American Indians do exactly that. That's no longer Indian. It, it, it is something else, some new hybrid, some new mestizo hybrid as, as uh, uh, you know, a lot of colonized people might call it. And I would argue that if we're serious about reclaiming indigeneity, we have to move away from that borderland, away from Nipantla, away from that hybridity and reclaim, re, restructure, re, you know, give rebirth to those traditions that made us uh, independent and free people uh, before the colonizer uh, invaded our territory. Uh, understand what Miguel is saying. I understand the sentiment, of course. I understand the sentiment of Anseltua. But I don't think it's sustainable as, as a response to colonization. I think it ends up being a, a, a new affirmation of colonization. Uh, and at some point, you know, we have to break that bondage. Kakuna, maybe that's enough. Maybe someone else wants to uh, respond to uh, Miguel as well. I would respond, although thank you, night. Seem to be doing a lot of talking, but I would uh, respond only in this fashion: that circumstances vary, those of us in North America, by and large, have a lot further to travel in order to actually reconstitute the indigenous worldview to follow it, to apply it, understand it by way of actually living it, then people, well, in some cases, much further north, although even there, 
the circumstances have changed a lot, and particularly in the last 30 years. But when you begin to move south, you find ever increasing numbers of people who to greater extent than here and greater often one as compared to another have continued to live in those ways. And the first task it would seem to me is to undertake action to ensure that they are not subsumed completely as as completely as we have been up here by the colonizing impulse, which materially in particular needs to continue to expand. You've got villages in Guerrero province in Mexico, for example, that are their primary point of confrontation with the colonizing culture at this point is to prevent mapping other villages, mapping other territories in order that you have property assignments of the sort that prevail. We've been talking a lot about property. Well, everyone understands where everyone else lives in one of the villages in Guerrero, but it's not clear to the Mexican government they can't assign property without mapping it out and allowing the government to assert greater degrees of control on an individuated basis and allow the DEA to conduct its operations and all the rest of what's at issue. They continuing to live in the sort of collective fashion that has prevailed in that area since who knows when. In, the pre in taking the action to preserve that, we can maybe facilitate, accelerate a concretization of what it is that you, Miguel, and in a way, Tink, you too, and me, are trying to recover, which in part has to do with understanding, but in larger part, creating context for practice. So to be that understanding to become a lived reality. And in a sense, it is much more concrete than is presently possible. That's the nature of the struggle to increase the realm of possibility, but increasing the realm of possibility may well be to a significant extent contingent upon preserving it where it's not been eclipsed already. Does this follow for you? I, uh, um, uh, I, I, I do think that um, uh, the in-between space uh, exists, that it is a product uh, of colonialism. I also think that occupying the in-between space uh, is a possibility insofar as it can be a strategy, uh, you, know, you know, deployed uh, in a perpetual attempt to decolonize. Um, but, um, you know, I, I doubt that it could ever be uh, a destination uh, you know, a place of, of um, you know, uh, a place where one finds reasons for why one struggles for justice uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and freedom. Um, the in-between space exists as that which invites perpetual overcoming, uh, not settlement, right? So um, uh, I, I uh, you know, precisely because it's created and produced in and through, uh, you know, the machinations uh, uh, of, of colonialism. Uh, you see, colonialism thrives by splitting uh, humans into 
uh, into spaces, into categories, into identities. Uh, and so in a certain sense, we are all caught in some in-between space. Um, uh, part of what we were talking about earlier in terms of um, you know, reciprocity and holistic understandings of the universe, uh, the world and, and, uh, you know, and so on has to do with sort of overcoming those splits and those dualisms and those in-between spaces. Right, so the in-between space is not the utopia, if I may put it like that. Uh, 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 it is but a moment uh, that we go through again and again and again as we seek to um, to repair the damage, uh, you know, the damage of of uh, you know the damage that that colonialism has um, has has done. Uh, the second thing that I would say is that. Um, um, the idea um, of sort of belonging to the in-between uh, is a way of allowing oneself to be claimed by it. Uh, uh, the key thing I think is to claim it, right? And, uh, and then to use it as a tool and as an instrument. And I think there's a real distinction there, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, a linguistic, you know, uh, a, ling a linguistic distinction, you know, who, who owns who, you're owned by in between space, it becomes a kind of ontological space, um, right? And, um, uh, or you own it, which means that uh, you make choices and decisions about what you are going to do in that space. Um, so, you know, those would be some thoughts that I would bring to the conversation about that space. I acknowledge it exists. I acknowledge that it's a product of colonialism. I don't believe that uh, uh, it is um, the final reason why one resists colonialism. Rather, it points to something beyond itself towards which, um, you know, uh, or back to which, maybe not necessarily towards, but back to which, um, you know, we, uh, uh, we, you know, we must go. You know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and I totally agree, except I'm just have to say that I have no destination to go to, and I have no place to go back to. Um, mm -hmm. The in-between space is all I have. You know, ever since my conquistador grandfather raped his African slave, it created a new people that I'm part of. Um, I, I can't go back to my conquistador uh, Spaniard Catholicism, and I can't really go back to my African grandmother's slaves. Uh, you were religious. I, I, I'm just trying to say it's a little, a little more complicated when you actually live in that space where both sides kind of reject you. Um, and, and you do the best you can to live in, in, the, in that little contradiction. And it's a contradiction, it's a horrible contradiction, but, but then again, Miguel Unamuno says that all of us live in contradictions and, and, and I'm just being human and that's part of my humanity. So I guess what I'm asking is, can it be that one of the consequences of colonialism, one of the negative consequences, one of the horrible uh, uh, consequence of colonialism is the creation of a new people that is not rooted anywhere. And, 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 I, and I would argue that some of us from uh, the Caribbean um, find ourselves in that space. So when you ask, and, you know, the common joke in Cuba, when you ask, you know, how many people are Catholic, they say about 80% of the island. And when you ask how many people follow the, San, the, the, the Santos, the, the Orishas, the, the answer is 100%. Uh, we've learned how to belong to different religious traditions or different spiritualities or different ways of being that are contradictory to each other, but yet we try to find harmony within ourselves. So Miguel, I, you know, I would agree with you that colonialism produces uh, uh, different kinds of things, new peoples, you know, new realities and so on. Uh, and I think what you have uh, is the new people uh, and they do belong somewhere, as you said just now, everywhere and nowhere. And, and that's a powerful reality, right? That's a decolonial reality in itself, 
right? This ability to uh, uh, to belong, you know, uh, to say I come from the Caribbean, you know, I belong to this group of new people, uh, and yet I belong nowhere, uh, right? Uh, because um, you know that allows you to transcend um, colonial boundaries. Uh, it allows you to overcome, uh, you know, the uh, 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 the imposition uh, uh, of sort of, you know, um, you know, the, uh, the colonial, uh, you know, way of belonging, you know, which is that you speak this language and you belong to this category. Uh, so I would say that in betweenness uh, is the ability, uh, the resilient power, if you will, um, um, to belong everywhere and nowhere at the same time. I would say that, um, you know, uh, that, that sort of dialectic helps, um, uh, in fact, um, you know, um, go through and negate, overcome uh, 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 in-betweenness as a final destination. Okay. In other words, maybe the destination is in the process, that the process is ongoing. Uh, that it is a process of reconstitution, self-reconstitution, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, I like this, Miguel, because you and I have, you know, uh, when I was at ILF at any rate, we sort of um, hinted at the possibility of having this kind of, you know, um, uh, this kind of conversation, and now we're having it, and um, that's wonderful. And we have Tink to thank for that. I wanted to say that as somebody who also feels very much in between cultures, um, I, I think it's, at least, I think it's important not to define ourselves as not this and not that, in, because that sort of implies that we have to choose a singular identity. And one of the things that I've really seen from a lot of um, indigenous cultures seems to be an understanding that that identities can be multiple and overlapping and interrelated. And I think that maybe we need to think a little bit more about how to incorporate that understanding into our lives. Um, but I also have been thinking throughout this conversation about what Memi said about the colonizer and the colonized, right? And how there aren't good colonizers and bad colonizers, there's colonizers and there's colonized. And to some extent we have, you know, not to some extent, I think we just, have to choose essentially which side of that equation we're going to put our energies into. And that to me is not a matter of our sort of genetic heritage, right? But it's a question of where are we gonna put our energies in this struggle and whether the way in which we identify ourselves and participate in society is empowering the colonizers or empowering the colonized. And to me that, I don't, I don't know, those are just some thoughts because that you raise great questions. Can I interject? Go ahead. Neha. Yate. Thank you, uh, panelists. I, I didn't mean to want to say anything, but uh, my brother out there, Tink, and I go back a long way. And I uh, want to thank you and also for Ward and my sister there, uh, uh, Natsu. So, you know, uh, I was just thinking, I'm reading this book right now. It's called uh, Born a Crime. Anybody familiar with this? It's by Trevor Noah. Talk about decolonization right here. You know, when he was born uh, in South Africa, uh, he was classified as, you know, undefined because uh, he was both, his mother was African, she was black and his, his father was Swiss. But he talks about his mother. He grew up with his mother. He speaks his mother's language and other five other indigenous languages. I think a lot of these contradictions are perpetuated through the academy you know, which is part of the colonial enterprise. It has colonized us. It has made us doubt who we really are. And as my teacher, Tashley Jones Benali says, he says, you can go on and be a big professor and academic, 
uh, you know, an, a specialist, a distinguished scientist, and do all the things that you're required to do, but it will never tell you about who you really are. Because we belong to the spiritual universe. And as I reflect on this hybridity and the problem of even using language, I think Tink has said it very well. In terms of indigenous languages, you know, if you look at many of the African languages, for example, there's no specific pronouns for she and he. And it, you know, it's living, it's, it's, it's verbal, it's active. And it's because it's related to all of everything in life. There is nothing that's dead. In fact, we don't even die. You know, we just change form and return to our essence. That's part of our indigenous being. So I think a lot of these, you know, these discursive discussions within the academy are really prohibitions and prescriptions against us being who we are, to decolonize, to de-academize the academy so that it creates a space for us to advance these struggles. Because I think, you know, as Natsu made the point, we make decisions. Trevor identified with his mother, of course, because his father was never there, but he followed his mother. And so in making those decisions, we need to determine and to realize, just like with the African people who were brought to this country against their will, they still African people. They are not American people. I have a big problem with the term African American because America as it stands is a fundamental contradiction, annihilation of African identity. They lost their names. We're African people. Africa has never abandoned us. And when the Africans were brought to Brazil and fled in Suriname into the plantations to be with indigenous people, they poured libations to this land in honor of the ancestors of the indigenous people, wherever we are, you know? So I think that the academy and the kinds of convoluted discussions we have all the time tend to obscure this essence of who we are under the pretext or rubric of hybridity because that's what standardization is all about. You know, it takes us away from our real roots in the earth and our languages. We should, yes, we should struggle to relearn the languages of our ancestors as Trevor did. You know, this is a struggle. We're here to struggle. So Tashley Jones says, when we born, we born into jeopardy on this earth, our life is in balance. We don't know if we're gonna make it, but if we don't know who we are at the essence, we certainly, and Miguel was talking about that destination, we headed nowhere because we don't understand who we are. So comments, friends, I hear. Excuse me, I hate to interrupt here, but we have another session starting pretty soon. So um, do, do we want to kind of wrap up here quickly? Yeah, yeah, Carl, I was just, I, I had an eye on the time. So the next session's at 3.15, but if we just take the next seven minutes and kind of dwell on, on some of this and let, let some people respond, I think that it'll be fine. Uh, before we sign off, I just want to say 
thank you to everyone. This has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, I, I've enjoyed it from beginning to end, and I've appreciated uh, things everyone has said. And even the press back from Miguel de la Torre, as I told you, we've had that conversation ongoing for some time, and it's not going to end here. We'll keep talking about it. <laughs> he has uh, a manuscript ready to publish uh, uh, that I've read that uh, will uh, bring the conversation into the light again, and we'll have it some more. <laughs> uh, but even in our disagreements, we deeply respect and enjoy one another. Uh, great comments, Julian. I appreciate what you were saying from, from uh, uh, a different indigenous perspective as a South African. Uh, Ward and Natsu, Edward, what a treasure to have you uh, for a few minutes electronically. <laughs> and I look forward to the end of this pandemic when we can actually uh, uh, greet one another uh, and, and be with one another. Miguel and I had coffee last week. <laughs> we both are vaccinated, so we sat outside at our favorite coffee shop Thank you all very much. I'm going to sign off and hear what anybody else has to say as a closing comment. Kakuna, wita watonde kidetani. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. For thank you very much. Participating. I do thank want to you. thank all the um, contributors to the book um, for, for, for making this a reality. And I want to thank Tintinka, from whom I have learned so much, and I am a better scholar because I have had him both as a colleague and someone that I've read pretty much everything he's written and has been greatly influenced by it. And, and as, I close, as we close, I do wanna at least say one, one famous saying from my culture, uh, based on this last conversation we had, lo que me dio el egua, no hay quien me lo quite. And to translate, um, that which the um, God el egua gave me, no one is gonna take it away from me. I, I love, there's a quote here that Julian gave that I really want to be like the resounding batter of this conference, given who most of us are, and that is decolonization is deacclimatization. And I think very often, even when we're talking about decolonizing, we're still, we're not, we're, we're not thinking the question of who we really are. And I just want to, I want to, all of you have expressed that in different ways from, from where you were coming from. And I'm just, I'm just so grateful. And I do think much of this will carry right over into the next conversation, which is with Walter Mignolo and Tink is, is going to be a respondent there as well. So we don't have to stop thinking about this, this right now or anything. <laughs> um, we've got a few more days of the conference too. Yeah, you don't have to sign off just because the session is over. You just stay on here and we're going to, uh, I'm going to cut off the recording and then we need to kind of bring the people who are, um, you know, going to be the next session up, make sure everybody's here. So thank you very much. Yeah. And then, and there was a lot in the chat. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of it. Um, I do just want to presence a couple of the thoughts that came up, which was, was one was what does land back mean? You know, what does land back look like? Um, and that's something that we don't have to answer it right now, but I just want it to be present in the in the conference. Um, and then uh, the question of what is common and uh, whether it's water or or the common, somebody brought up Sylvia Federici. Um, and, and so I'm just, just putting that out into this space as we're thinking in the next few minutes and um, moving into the next panel as well.